find strength to face a day in your presence all our fears are washed away oh when we see you lord because when we see you we find strength to face a day in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away
good morning, everyone, or afternoon or evening, depending on when you're watching this. Welcome to our Bible teaching, preaching time, our time to study the Word of God in our worship service here at Eastside. I'm so glad you've taken time to join us and hope that as the fall continues, you'll find yourself at Eastside Live on Sunday mornings at 11 o'clock. We'll look forward to having you here. Now, right here and now, we're in the middle of a series called The Parables of Jesus. And today we want to look at the parable of the rich fool. Some have called it the parable of the, of the silly farmer or the foolish farmer. We'll call it the parable of the rich fool, and we turn to God's word in the book of Luke to chapter 12, beginning at verse 13. Let's follow along in the word of God and see what we can learn today in this another parable of Jesus. It says in verse 13 of Luke 12, someone in the crowd said to him, that's Jesus. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you, that is you and your brother. Then Jesus said to them, everyone around him, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist and an abundance of possessions. He makes the principle, states it, and now creates parable. He told them this parable in verse 16, the the ground or the property, the farmland of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, this farmer, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared all for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Now, as we join Jesus here in this setting, we discover that there is a family in and around that area that is having a conflict over their inheritance, what they're going to receive from the prior generation. That still happens today. In fact, every single year in America, there's approximately a trillion dollars that will pass on through wills and estates from one generation to the next. And in the mix of those uh, stories, wills and estates, will be situations where there will be family members in conflict, just like here in this passage. Brother versus sister, brother versus brother, sister versus sister, sister versus brother, on and on it goes. Children and grandchildren that will have a family feud over their prospective inheritance. And there's a man here in verse 13 who is experiencing that very thing. He's going through a family feud and he says, Jesus, Rabbi, teacher, would you please tell my brother to divide our inheritance with me, what's rightfully mine? (laughs) And I think quite interestingly, Jesus stays away from that family matter. Jesus doesn't want to get in that family squabble, and he says in, in, in verse 14, man who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you and your brother. Jesus is saying, that's really not my affair. That's not my priority today. And so Jesus stays away from that because Jesus has a a bigger and nobler purpose in this particular passage. He wants to teach a principle. And he's teaching on top of a principle that he just came out of in the earlier verses. In fact, in the earlier verses, before what we read here, Jesus issues a warning on hypocrisy. He issues a warning on hypocrisy. In fact, in verse 1, it says that Jesus says to the people, be on guard. Here's a warning. Be on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, the growth 
of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So, so Jesus has already been setting the table on the dangers of hypocrisy and transitions here in verse 13 into a second warning or a second danger, and that is the danger of covetousness or the danger of greed. Now, I hope that all of you would agree with me that it is hard not to covet. It is hard not to covet. It's an age-old, ages-old dilemma. It's a problem. It's a big deal, coveting. It's a sin. In fact, in Exodus 20, verse 17, the Lord gets very specific in the Ten Commandments related to coveting. And there we find that we are not to covet our neighbor's house. We're not to covet our neighbor's spouse. We're not to covet our neighbor's property. We are not to covet our neighbor's servants. We are not to covet our neighbor's animals. Back in that day, that's means of work or means of transportation. It's hard, though, not to covet. Let's face it. When a neighbor, when a friend, when a family member gets something that we really would like to have. And yet coveting is a, it, it's a problem. It's a sinful issue. In fact, Psalm chapter 10, Psalm 10 looking at verse 2, says that a wicked man boasts about the cravings of the heart. The wicked man boasts about the cravings of the heart, which means it's, it's wicked, it's sinful, it's wrong to covet. But let's face reality, it, it's really hard not to covet in our world today or in worlds before. But it's overrated, all the stuff. Don't forget the King Solomon, who at that time had accumulated more than anyone else in human history when he was writing the book of Ecclesiastes. He had, he had collected all of the stuff that you could have of wealth in this world and worlds to come, more than anyone up to that time in human history. And yet he writes in Ecclesiastes that all of his wealth, all of his money, all of his material possessions, it's just vanity. It's empty. It's just void. There's nothing of eternal value to it. Libraries are filled with books, biographies about people who had a lot of money but didn't have a lot of happiness. Newspapers, websites are filled with stories of people who discovered that the abundance of riches cannot bring contentment. Just recently, this month in the news, one of the richest couples in the world, we read, are separating and divorcing after 27 years. We need to pray for them and hope that they can make that right and get back together. But one of the obvious things that's uncovered in the story is that even this couple being one of the richest couples in the world, they discover that having all of that money would not give them marital bliss. You know, when Paul was writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, he said that basically the only way to know contentment in your life is to know Jesus Christ. He says godliness, that's a relationship with God through Jesus. Godliness with contentment brings great gain. Let me ask you, have you entered into a relationship with Jesus Christ? The ultimate contentment of life with all kinds of riches or no riches at all, is centered and focused on a saving, forgiving relationship with Jesus. Have you experienced that in your life? At the end of this message today, I want to give you an opportunity to pray to receive Jesus. And I hope that you will. Because when you have Jesus Christ in your life, it is then you accumulate true eternal wealth. It's when you gain true emotional holistic contentment. Now back to the passage in verse 15, Jesus is driving home a point that we don't want to forget. Jesus drives home a point in verse 15 when he says, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed because life, all of life, the meaning of life does not consents, con consist in having an abundance of riches. 
life's not defined. The quality of life is not defined by the amount of wealth you have. Just doesn't exist. So that's why Jesus says, watch out. Be on guard. Jesus says, be careful. Because if you think wealth brings happiness and contentment, you're believing a lie. And that's the principle. And what Jesus does in his parables is that he then provides a story that is a illustration or a backup of the principle so you can get your hands around it, get your arms around it, and put it to practice in your life. And in the context here of Luke chapter 12, Jesus introduces us to a story, to a parable about a rich fool or a a greedy farmer. We're introduced to him in verse 16. The farmer himself was already wealthy. The farmer himself already rich. There is this abundant harvest, and he is now adding to his wealth with this harvest that is on its way. It's all extra. Now, there's nothing wrong with wealth. There's nothing wrong with having stuff. There's nothing wrong with having more. But there are some perils, the scriptures tell us, when it comes to money and the life of a, of a person. You know, one of the things the Bible teaches us is that wealth can choke the word of God in our lives. It can just choke the word. It can cause us wealth to suffocate, not have sufficient oxygen or nutrients for our soul because we get so consumed with wealth we don't have time for the word or we don't have time to apply the word or we're so rich we don't think we need the word. Another thing that wealth can do is is it creates snares and temptations. That's a peril of prosperity. It can create snares and temptations, traps, You can fall into all kinds of temptations because with more money, you have more options. With greater margins, you have more options. You don't have debt, so you have more options. You've got abundance, you have more options. And sometimes those options aren't sanctified. Sometimes those options aren't holy. Sometimes those options aren't options of biblical values. So be careful. Jesus is warning us. Be careful. Wealth can choke the word. Wealth can create snares and temptations. And another thing that wealth can do, and I think that's true here in this parable, is wealth can give a false sense of security. Because you're wealthy, you can eat, drink, be merry, be satisfied. You, you can have plenty of money for plenty of years. I'm never going to have to worry about money again. And what happens is you get a false sense of security that you are invincible when in fact you're not. Well, that's the situation we have here. This is a a wealthy farmer who is about to get wealthier, and when the new harvest comes, I want you to pay attention to what the, (laughs) pay attention to what the farmer says. The farmer says here, um, I don't have any more barn space for this new harvest. For this abundant harvest, I've run out of warehouse space. I've run out of silos. I'm just going to have to tear down my warehouses that I have, my silos that I have, my barns that I have, and I'm going to have to build brand new and bigger warehouses, storage houses. Now, what Jesus, I believe, is wanting us to see here is a matter of what, listen to this, When all this was happening to this already rich man and more stuff was coming his way, notice his first impulse. His first impulse was to take care of himself. I count approximately 10 to 11 personal pronouns in the man referring to himself as to how he is going to solve this problem of needing more space for more grain or more corn or whatever that harvest may be. And here's the tragedy. 
His first impulse is to look out after himself. And not anywhere in this parable where this man is speaking, where Jesus is providing him with the script, nowhere in the story do you find the man thinking about any need that his neighbors might have, any need that the poor around him or in nearby cities might have. It's not there. It's all about his abundance becoming even more abundant. Now, according to the word of God, the law, as the Jews would read it, said this. The law said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your soul, your strength, and your mind, followed by and love your neighbor as yourself. And this man's first impulse, watch this, this man's first impulse was to look after number one, to look after himself. This man was violating the law. This man was violating righteousness. This man was ignoring charity toward others, all because he could look after himself. little poetry here. I don't often do it, but I thought this was good because I think it reflects this man and his self-centeredness. I had a little tea party this afternoon at three. It was very small, three guests and all, just I, myself, and me. Myself ate all the sandwiches while I drank up all the tea. Twas also I who ate the pie and passed the cake to me. Beloved, this is a human tragedy. This is a man who was already wealthy, who was becoming wealthier, and never gave any concern about the local orphanage, never gave any concern about widows that existed. We think of biblical examples of widows who were struggling like Ruth in that same area of the world, in that same kind of context, he gave no thought to what it might be to, to a, a man who was having a difficult time with his tenant farm. He gave no thought to, to try to think about someone who was unemployed. He gave no thought to that at all. And then watch this. Here is the savior of the universe's conclusion about that man. Look at verse 20. Jesus says, you are a fool. You're a fool. This very night, verse 20 says, your life will be demanded from you, then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? It's going to go to somebody else who may act like a fool too. His neighbor saw him as intelligent. His colleagues saw him as successful. Community members saw him as a leader, but God called him a fool. And you know what a fool is? A fool is an individual who leaves God out of any consideration. No consideration whatsoever. A fool says, uh, my house, my land, my silo, my barns, my property, my crops, my, 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 my house, my land. And a few years later, someone else is going to have all of that same stuff and is going to say, my house, my land, my, my, my. And the irony is they're talking about the same house, the same property, the same land that produces the crop. It's just in different generational or, or economic situational terms, degrees of ownership. It's not yours. It belongs to God. And you and I are just simply stewards of whatever it is God entrusts us because the house I live in today, someone's going to live in it later. Any property you own today, somebody's going to have that property later. And if you or I think that it's ours, we're 
biblical fools. Or fools. The man had gathered all his treasure on earth, but Jesus said he had stored none of his treasure in heaven. Same idea is expressed in this epitaph. Here lies John Rackett in his wooden jacket. He kept neither horses nor mules. He lived like a hog and he died like a dog. All he did was leave his money to fools. By all appearances, I mean, think about it. Think about society, social life. By all the external appearances, this was a good man. This was a man who was community involved. He was an honest citizen. He had no mafia ties. Probably a member of a first church of something. Lived in the best part of town. Faithful in his marriage. Took care of his children. Yet watch this. Jesus called him a fool. Psalm 141, verse 1, famously says, The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The slavish, literal Hebrew context of that, the fool has said in his heart, no God. That's the way this farmer lived his life. And that's the way many people live their lives today. This is not my recipe or definition of fool. It is, a re- it is a recipe or definition from the Lord Jesus Christ. A person who lives his or her life leaving God out of any consideration, Jesus says, is a fool. We round the circle, round the track, coming to the finish line like a, a horse that will go through the Belmont stake soon, and we come to the finish line with Jesus himself making the application. And I want you to look here at verse 21. In in verse 21, here is what Jesus says. This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God or does not invest in the things of heaven. This is how it will be. You're going to live a life defined in God's eyes as a fool. The opposite of being rich toward God, the last words of the lesson today, verse 21, um, the opposite of being rich toward God is laying up treasures for yourself. So you're living your life laying up treasures for yourself, or you're living your life laying up treasures in heaven, rich toward God. So let me ask you, how does that strike you? How does that strike you? How does the question or comparison define you, define me? Are you living your life with the material blessings, the financial blessings that God's given you? Are you you rich toward God or are you rich toward yourself? When you're investing money Is it primarily and passionately the things of this world that benefit yourself? Or is there a priority element, a first fruits effort of investing in the things of God? Why do you why do you have the money you have? Why do I have the money I have? It's, it's, if, if you spend or you save, either one, you're a spender or a saver, why do we have what we have? Is it, is it primarily all about retirement? And I understand retirement. I have retirement plans and a, a plan that, I, that I, I have for my life, and that's good stewardship. That's not my point. Please don't get on those minor issues. But there are some people that are just consumed with saving and forgetting God and investing in God's work in the kingdom of heaven. And then there are people that are just consumed with spending. They, they make a lot of money, they spend a lot of money, but they're not investing in the things of God and the things of eternity. And this is Jesus's, this is Jesus's parameters, and he's, he's making it so clear. Don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. While you're making it here, that it which will belong to someone else a generation or two from now, after you're dead, 
take a portion of what you're getting now and invest it in the things of heaven. Is your goal to have expensive things? Okay. But while you're in the mix of that, are you losing, have you lost, or have you never pondered the importance of investing what God has given to you to begin with back into the kingdom of God? So think beyond yourself. Here's some Here's some important truth. Jesus is saying it's essential that we understand how to use what we've got. Wherever we are on the, on the economic ladder, we need to be able to use what we've got. Use what we've got. And how, 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 do you, how do you do that? Well, use what you've got for God's kingdom. Use what you, you've got for, for God's kingdom. Um, you can be rich toward God in giving money. You can also be rich toward God in, in, in your faith, growing in the Lord Jesus Christ. You can be rich toward God in your volunteerism. You can be rich toward God in caring for the poor. Just context, Eastside. I think sometimes we're so blessed we just take it for granted. But, but, but hear me out. Every day at Eastside, you have an opportunity through our Mosaic campus to care for the poor. Every day. Every day. We have an organized, systemized structure to feed hundreds of families in the most needy areas of Cobb County and Eastside Church as empowered by God and God's people are getting that done. Are you engaged in helping the poor in your church, from your church, or with another worthy organization? Use what you've got for God's kingdom. Secondly, use what you've got to be sensitive to other people's needs. Other people have hurts, and we need to be sensitive to, to their needs, to, to their hurts, and help them in Jesus' name. Maybe it's a bill that you could pay. Maybe it's a meal for someone that you could provide. Maybe it's a, a transportation that you could give. Either a trip or maybe lend a vehicle to someone who doesn't have a car right now to get to work and you've got several sitting around. Maybe you could provide some babysitting or child care for a single parent who needs to have that time to go on a job interview. I mean, the fool is not paying any attention to these things going on around them in their neighborhoods. All they care about themselves, that's a fool. But the wise Christ follower is sensitive, paying attention to other people's needs and other people's hurts. And how can I, how can I find a need and fill it? And how can I find a hurt and heal it? That's the mantra. That's the theme for the Christ follower who has been so very blessed by God. Use what you've got. Be sensitive to other people's needs and hurts. And then finally, just use what you've got. Don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. Reality check. Jesus says this. And understand, reality check. You could be dead by tonight. What are you going to leave behind? What will be your legacy? Jesus says to this fool, he says, this very night, tonight your life will be demanded from you, and God can make that demand. So don't be a fool. You're going to stand before the Lord one day. I'm going to stand before the Lord one day with all of the stuff that he's given us, the lives that we've lived. And if we have a reputation, if our biography is that we just keep accumulating more and more and more and ignore the lost, ignore the poor, ignore the oppressed, ignore those that have been taken advantage of, if that's the way we're going to live our lives, fools are what we are. Don't be a fool. 
Be someone under God that will determine to be better. Use what you've got. When you die, when I die, we leave all the stuff that we've accumulated behind us. We brought nothing into this world, and we will take nothing out. Every, um, every day, almost every day, I read the obituaries of the Marietta Daily Journal, neighborhood newspapers online. I read who died, and it's almost every other week I recognize someone from my childhood, someone I went to school with, or the parents of someone I went to school with that has passed away. And I think about them, and I offer prayer for them. Sometimes I'll forward that news to other friends of mine from those Marietta days when I knew those people when I was young or recent. And I will, I, will, I will look at that, and it will always occur to me that when it's over, someone will say at the end of the old bed, the, the author will say, the family won't communicate it, you can leave in this person's honor a gift to a church or to a charity or to some type of nonprofit. Never in any obituary anywhere in the world do you have a record of someone who is saying in the obituary that all of their possessions followed them through death and into eternal life? It's like the old saying, you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul because you cannot take it with you. You can't. Don't be a fool. Don't be a fool. Do you know what lasts in life where wisdom rests? It's in a relationship with Jesus Christ. In fact, that's where life begins. Wisdom is, is what you do with Christ and coming to Christ and receiving him as your Lord and Savior, experiencing the forgiveness of sin. It all begins with a relationship with Jesus. Do you have that relationship? You may have money, lots of it. You may have lots of land. You may have many things, many acquisitions. Your portfolio may be impressive. After death, that means absolutely nothing as you get ready to face eternity. The only thing that matters as you face eternity is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Do you have one? Do you have such a relationship? If you want to be rich towards God, as Jesus talks about, it begins with knowing Jesus. And so would you right where you are, if you'd like to know Jesus, would you pray with me this prayer? Dear God in heaven, I am a sinner in need of the Savior. Please forgive me of my sins. I believe in my heart. I confess with my mouth that Jesus died for me, that he rose from the dead, and that he lives forever. I believe Jesus only can forgive me of my sins. Thank you that Jesus died on the cross for me. Thank you that he took all of his sin, my sin on him. And now I say, come into my life, Lord Jesus, and give me the ability to live for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer, I'd love to send you this book. It's a book to help you grow in Christ. It's written by a friend of mine, Jeff Cranston. It's called Your Greatest Adventure, Taking the Next Steps in Your Faith. This will teach you how to be wise in your life. This will teach you how to be rich toward God and never fall into the category of the fool like the farmer in the parable today. There is a Websites, you can write to me. I'd love to, I'd love to hear from you. Email address, you, you let me know, and we'll send this to you as our gift to help you begin to grow in Christ. Ask for the book on adventure, your greatest adventure. It's ours to send to you, our gift to you, because we love you. God bless you today. Thanks so much for joining us, and I hope that you'll, we'll see you soon here at Eastside, that you'll join us, and together we can grow in the Word of God together. 
goodbye, and God bless. 